Fantastic. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Nadim and Nick and the whole of the um, committee. Thank you. It's, I'm so excited about this. So I want to just share with you Anne's treatment journey tonight. Um, all of the, the slides, all of the PDF uh, of tonight's presentation is you can actually download it from my website. So um, if you just go to resources and then click on that, and then scroll down. Now for the full membership presentation, I've, um, I've done references for tonight's talk. So they're on that there, so you can download that. And also um, every slide that I'm showing this evening. So let's dive in, let's have a look at, um, uh, actually it looks like someone's drawn a, a mark on the screen there. And so Nick, um, if you could sort of disable that, there so that uh, those lines aren't put on here. It's disable an attendee annotation um, just on the there. And if we can just get rid of that, I'm going to remove that somehow. Sorry, Finley, I'm just trying to sort out. It's all right. There is a way of doing it, but it might be, if I un I'm going to come out of this, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop share and yeah. then redo the share. And then if we disable the annotation, then that should work. I was worried where those drawings were going for a second. <laughs> that's right so there we go all right that's cool fine so that's good right okay so here we go so you can actually download that so let's have a look at uh um, Anne here so Anne uh, in her medical history was fairly clear apart from anxiety so she had um agoraphobia and she'd not really been away from home, spent a, a night away from home for quite a number of years. She took citalopram and propranolol to um, settle that. And when she concentrated on stuff, she started to shake a little bit. So on, her concerns were about her teeth, her, all of her upper teeth and her crowns and bridges are loose. She felt that dentures seemed like the only option for her. And she felt her bottom teeth were not so good, but they were still functional. So she was referred to me um, for her upper teeth by a dentist and her GDP is gonna look after her lower teeth. So I always like, and this is what John Bessford has really drummed into me, is to create a wish list um, for a patient. So then we can see whether we can actually address that. So she wanted advice on an upper denture. She wanted me to provide a working denture and she'd been really scared by her dentist. And also she'd been to Liverpool Dental Hospital where she'd come away with the impression that nothing could be done. A denture was not possible for her. So she was really quite desperate and she wanted me to provide a good looking denture for her. So she wanted this photograph here of her natural teeth, which is on the left hand side there. She wanted that, but finer. Let's have a look in the mouth. So if I was going to take a periodontal probe here and poke that down the gingival margins there, we've got six millimeter plus pockets on the upper teeth here. And we've got missing posterior teeth. We've also got a, a quite a, a V-shaped and deep vault here that holds no fear at all for dentures for me um, in the slightest. In fact, it's advantageous in a flat maxilla. Um, the dentist had supplied me with an OPG uh, radiograph and it indicated on here um, where I've drawn the red line, 60 to 90% bone loss in these different areas there. So that's 
generalized periodontitis, it's very severe and it's rapidly progressing. And the other diagnoses are that she's got missing teeth, she's got functional chewing issues and aesthetic failure. So it's really now I've made that diagnosis when she came in, I've now got to decide or had to decide what to do for her. Doing nothing was really not an option for her. She was at that point where she wanted to have treatment. I really, once I'd looked in the mouth, I just thought a complete denture was going to be the right option for her, a clearance. However, I love natural teeth. I don't like taking them out. And a partial denture may have fulfilled certain functional aspects, but I really felt that a, a good aesthetic outcome was quite limited. Plus, the fact that she's agoraphobic, I wanted to do something that was going to last so that she wasn't going to have further problems with her teeth. We could also in, we could explore the implant supported over denture option should the complete upper denture not work. But the implant supported fixed teeth in the maxilla, I thought was a no, no really certainly in my hands maybe in other members and people who are watching tonight they're much better at implant supported fixed restorations than me but with a really high smile line i have had my fingers burnt a lot of times with putting with removing teeth having implants placed and then having the flange of the denture potentially showing and having to try and hide it just like in Caroline here, this is my last ever all on six case in the maxilla and all on four in the mandible for her. I don't do that restoration anymore. I refer it to other people. Um, but with Caroline, she's got a really high smile line when she goes for it. We plan, she's got an all on six there. We planned where the bone level needed to be with a CT scan, but even with me watching the surgeon place the implants and drill the bone down, she still needed a flange on the all on six here. And I'm, I'm quite embarrassed to show it actually, this, that's the, the flange there and here. And it does, you know, it's hidden by the patient, but when I review her every year, I'm so, I absolutely hate it, I take it off and there's all of this plaque underneath because it's wrapping around that flange to give it good aesthetics. And also during lockdown, this happened to her as well. So she broke that off there. And that's because there's really a lack of space for putting the, um, the actual uh, teeth on that bar. And it's a real issue with these type of restorations. We maybe could have got away with the zirconia um, but that's, that is a real issue with this. So I thought that was a no-no for Anne. So treatment, this is what I wanted to do for her, is to take out all of the upper teeth. This is after we'd, uh, and, and actually leave it for 12 months and then do a definitive upper denture. That was my basic plan. But I talked through all of the options with Anne here. This is at the consultation appointment and with her husband as well. And it's great having a supportive partner. John was terrific with this. And I can talk her through all of the different options there. So she wanted all of these things here on a wish list. And I knew I could provide all of those three things, definitely. So after discussing that, I then prepared a plan for her. And I love doing this. This is, this is I learned this from Mike Wise in the, back in the 1990s and the treatment planning card so that I've got every appointment accounted for. And so we can plan the whole thing. It looks really professional and also it's properly costed too. And then I prepare a really detailed letter for the patients as well with the diagnoses, treatment, treatment options, and then what we propose there. So uh, treatment visit one, I sat down with, uh, with Anne and then talked it through with her. Now what I do with the patient, I do this with Zoom and record the Zoom conversation so the patient has it before they actually come in.
So here we are, let's get into the clinical work. So this is my primary impression for the immediate denture. And I'm gonna do this in two bits. So I have some injectable alginate, which I squirt up between the ridge and the lip into the sulcus all the way around. You can see Claire's got these little retractors just to lift the lip away. You'll also maybe be able to see her just shaking a little bit as well whilst we're doing this. And I'm talking to her and just placing the tray and just gently pushing it up. And I'm, I'm talking to the patient all the time whilst I'm doing this, just in a really calm voice. She's looking straight at me. I'm just pushing that up and then getting the lip right around, lifting the lip up and gently feeding the alginate into the depth of the sulcus. Because I want to get a great special tray made for this patient. We'll just take that out now. So I just pop it out. And often the patient, when we're doing this, I find is quite nervous. It's their first treatment visit. They may be worried about teeth coming out in the impression. So I've just got to be really careful and gentle. The patient sitting up in the chair, just tweak it and ease that impression out. And it was great. She managed beautifully with that. And it was just a really good thing. I just knew she was going to be a great patient. Now, I cannot um, carry on without saying it's just so... Hello. Hi. So, um, I can't... It's so important having a fantastic... A technician and I think technicians do not get the credit that they deserve they are so important they're equal with dentists and I've worked with Rome for the past 20 years 21 years now and we've also got Sam who, who who's actually joined the practice a year ago and both Sam and Rowan work in the room next door to me in the clinic next door to me it's fantastic and you'll see all of that work tonight so this is the um so this is the primary impression that I've got for the uh, Mark I um, impression. I use Tropicalgin now and Neocolloid for the injectable materials, that's Zermac. You can get this from the PDF, you can download it. So that's the opposing impression in Blueprint. So let's move on now to the definitive impression for the immediate denture. I love this technique. This is something that Mike Wise taught me years ago and it's in his textbook, it's brilliant. So for doing a, a denture impression, an immediate denture, if we get a special tray made that just covers the denture bearing areas, and then over the top of that, we can have a little over tray that just goes over it like that. So we do it in two sections. And the beauty is this special tray, the under tray, I can take a really good impression of the denture bearing area without the teeth getting in the way. So I try that in and check that it's two millimeters short the depth of the sulcus. And then I do some border molding on this. So this is before border molding here. And then this is in the mouth with pulling the cheek and getting the patient to waggle the jaw side to side. And then I put dry this off and then I put zinc oxide in this, take this to the mouth just like this and gently rotate that in. We've got Vaseline on the lips, Vaseline on the teeth as well beforehand. Push that in fully. Patient sitting up in the chair. So push that down, nicely seat it. And then once it's fully seated, I border mold and trim the cheeks, get the patient to relax their cheeks fully. And so I'm just feeding it into the sulcus and then waggle the jaw side to side. Really go for it. And I also get the patient to open really wide as well. And then we pop that out. And it comes out like this. So it's a little bit untidy just around the edges. So what I do is I use a blade just to neaten that up and take away the excess zinc oxide but this is a beautiful 
full denture impression. It's great, I love it. And so I pop that back into the mouth now, like that, just fits it back down fully, and then mix some alginate up and take an impression of the, of the natural teeth themselves in that, and then it picks it up. And we take that out all together. And that gives us a great, gives me a great working model here, working cast there. So visit three, I did my um, MIP reg, intercuspal position. So this is where the teeth are touching really nicely together in intercuspal position and then just squirt some futar in. I don't bother trying to record CR at this point for the immediate denture. I go for CR in my definitive and I'll share with you that technique in a minute. But this is for the immediate. So that's the immediate, uh, the working cast mounted and then Rowan takes the teeth off. And what Rowan's thinking about here is, is just cutting the teeth down and drilling into those sockets about three to four millimeters, but doing very little preparation on the outside here. Because when I take the teeth out, I really don't want to be traumatizing the patient. I want them to come out, just take the teeth out. I don't want to be doing a lot of bone trimming. So I like the denture just to fit over the outside of the ridge, just like that. So that's the immediate there. If we look at the top of the immediate, it's very, very, very thin, paper thin almost, but this is not load bearing at all. And this just helps with the um, suction effect of the lips draping over the, um, the denture itself. So now how do we get decent aesthetics? What I just communicate, I think this is the absolute secret to the whole thing is good communication with the technician. And we just sit down and Rowan and I and Sam, we look at photos, we love it. Look at photos of the natural dentition and then where the patient is at at the moment. And we can see the teeth over erupting, they're coming down. And then we translate that onto our working cast. And then we then make the denture and correct various features that we see. So what we did for, um, for Anne was to lift the occlusal plane and also take it back a little bit. We lifted the incisal plane by 2.5 millimeters. So, and, and then this is the immediate that Rowan made for her with the shot lander teeth and the, the color tones, which are really lovely. So here we are at visit four now. So we've got Anne in the chair. This is an appointment I really don't like doing. It's not my favorite exercise is taking teeth out. We just gently remove all of the teeth and then just put a couple of sutures in as necessary. Now, what I find is with, with immediate dentures, they often rub, particularly around this area here, around the canine emin eminences. So, and a really great tip that Dr. Besford gave me was to use light bodied silicone in here. And we can then just check to see how much it rubs that area. So this is at the fit appointment. I just take the, um, there's a video here, press that. So I take that to the mouth. So it's got light bodied silicone. It's not, no adhesive on it. It's just applied. It's like a fit check push it right up so it sits back down onto the, the ridge, really push it up like that and then let it set and then I pop it out. And what I'm looking for here in particular is where the denture is showing through here. So on the, the canine eminence on this labial flange, I get a pencil and draw on that and then peel off the silicone and then just using a tungsten carbide drill away these little bits so I'll thin the flange down so it's not rubbing as much so that's it that's the complete denture fitted there and we found that the occlusion was just bang on there wasn't too much swelling quite often with immediate full dentures i'm quite often a bit disappointed with the amount of suction i get straight after i've taken the teeth out 
but it, I found it's just due to the bogginess of the tissues after placing the local anaesthetic. So I just sit on it and tell the patient it's going to be fine. In a week's time, the suction will be much better on the denture. But she coped beautifully with it. She was a really great patient. And um, so this is, um, Anne, uh, this is at one week at review here, a little bit of bruising, but we think at this point there's room for improvement this is like a diagnostic denture now and this is why i always budget for doing the definitive denture in the in the plan so that we can now make improvements so my protocol for doing immediate dentures is at two months i do a chair side reline because the fit is just dropping off then the suction effect you can see there's um, a gap there and a top tip that Rowan gave me for doing relines was this it's amazing is just a layer of wax on the labial surface of the teeth just keeping the little bit of the periphery exposed and this stops the reline the chair side reline material going over the edge and into the interdental embrasures and it means I can clean it up dead quick so what I do is I put Ufi gel uh, adhesive on there, all onto the fitting surface. And this is Ufi gel that I like to use, which is a hard reline material by Voco. Squirt that in and then fit it into the mouth. And what I'm doing here is I'm thinking about seating it right back onto the palate and I've got to push it really firmly because there's no resorption of the palate. So I want to push the denture back down so it's seated fully to keep the reline as thin as possible. And then I board a mold just like I'm doing for a complete denture, really go for it. Pop it out and all of that reline material has gone over and it's just sitting on the wax. And then, then what I do is I peel the wax off and it re reveals a lovely clean surface here. And then all we need to do is just trim it and then it goes back in the mouth and there we have it. So we've got the reline material. You can just see it there now. So then the next step is I like to leave it another two months. So four months after extracting the teeth, I will then do a lab reline. This is where it goes through to Rowan at nine o'clock in the morning. And then I fit it at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So I do roughen the surface a little bit of the denture um, and just remove some undercuts as well if there are undercuts there. Not very much though. I don't really obsess about it. And then I use this uh, Doric flow light material, Shotlander product. I put plenty of adhesive on the fitting surface and onto the peripheries, put this in, really push it down and board and mold it, just like I would do for a complete denture again. Again, I'm pushing it right down because I want it fully seated onto the palate. There's very little resorption occurs in that area. There's much more around the edges. So I want it to seat fully, keep it as thin as possible, keep my occlusion as close as possible as well. So, and then Rowan pours a model into that, does a little plaster index to maintain the occlusion. And then here we've got the reline uh, finished there. So beautifully thin around here, just underneath the base of the nose there. And so now Anne is in a great holding pattern. So I wait for eight months then. And with Anne, I didn't need to see her during that time. It was absolutely fine. So wait for 12 months until, so it's 12 months after extracting the teeth. And then we dive straight into doing the definitive denture. So primary impressions, just like you've seen before. And that, using a custom tray, custom tray, which is two millimeter spaced for alginate. I pop that in, board and mold that, waggling the jaw, opening wide, and then put plenty of adhesive on this, lots of adhesive. So these are my stops. 
goes into the mouth with alginate, a lovely runny mix of blueprint alginate. In it goes, you can see that I've spaced, so we've got two millimeters of gap between the sulcus and the border of the tray, and the patient is gonna mold that beautifully to the functional depth and width of the sulcus. And then Rowan really beautifully um, replicates that shape. So we've got a lovely land area to actually wax up the denture. So, and then it's visit three for the definitive denture, which is using a wax rim to carve and prescribe the tooth positions. And also this device here for recording a really accurate centric relation. This is a Gothic arch tracing thing. So, and this is actually, this was like a little special request from Corey Ferran. He wanted me to go into detail about how do we prescribe the replacement teeth and gums so nicely. And Corey, if you're listening tonight, the key for, is the photograph, the dentate photograph. If we've got a really good one to work from, that is our reference position. The next key is having a great dental nurse, Claire, who I've worked with for the past 13 years. And we both look at the patient together whilst I'm carving and shaping that rim. We're both looking at the photo, looking at the patient, and we do it in a set recipe. And it's those six points, and we do those step by step. And I'll just show you very simply what we're doing. So first of all, we do the lip support first. This is the first thing to do, because that governs how much tooth is gonna be showing as well. So it's lip support first, and I've got of really simple tools, it's just a wax knife, just for carving the labial edge down first. So that's number one. Number two is trimming the incisal plane parallel to the interpupillary line or parallel to whatever plane the teeth are if we're going to copy them. So that's number two. And I use a wallpaper scraper, it's a Harris wallpaper scraper for doing this, heated in a Bunsen. But actually what's really important, I think, is that I do this with, the, with it on the model and it stops it distorting. So I'm always putting it back onto the model. I then trim the occlusal plane parallel with the Ailotragus. This is key to great aesthetics is the Ailotragus line. And then four and five, I'm looking at buccal corridors, looking at the photo here like that. And I want to mimic this. And Claire and I are just looking at this the whole time during the whole appointment. The patient's head, they're just sitting upright in the chair. And then I do where the, I carve a, a mark where the center line is too. And it's lovely. And, I'm, and then that's the upper rim almost done. And then we've just got to look at the occlusal vertical dimension. And I use the John Coyce method of if the patient looks right, they are right in terms of the occlusal vertical dimension. So again, Claire and I just looking at the patient. If you look at Anne here, we want a lovely relaxed face, lovely. And it just, everything just looks right about it. And it's very much a dialogue between uh, Claire and I at this point, it really is. And then it's, this is quite interesting as well. The, the, in terms of the Mark I, the first denture, and our Mark II denture there, we're just bringing it further out, increasing the buccal corridors, exaggerating it a little bit. But this is a really key photo, I think. If you look just underneath the base of the nose here, with immediate dentures, they're often a little bit bulky underneath the base of the nose there. But now we've got the resorption, we've got the new rim in, it's lovely and thin, we can get better lip support with it. And we're looking really closely at this. So here we've got Mark 1 denture in, bulky, a little bit like a rugby bite guard, and then we've got a lovely lip shape here, there. And the mark two. And this is the must have photo for Rowan and Sam in the lab. They have to have these two photos.
so that um, so I've prescribed this I've carved that where I want the labial aspect of the teeth to go and then they can then place the denture teeth using that photo as a reference it's fantastic so that's prescribing the tooth positions it's literally just those seven those six steps that we do so let's now move on to recording centric relation really accurately and this is so crucial with a combination syndrome this is a patient who's got a full upper against natural lower the destabilizing forces on the upper denture are great with with natural teeth so i on the, that top plate there this is a plate that fits onto the working cast this whole thing and i put a black marker on that china graph this goes into the mouth and this is a video of the gothic arch tracing system so we've got a pin in the lower arch in fact i'm just going to go back to it just to show you what the whole system looks like again just to remind you so we've got this in the upper here and then this little device just fits in the lower with a pin so that pin touches the plate there that fits passively in the lower jaw so i'm just going to bring us back down to that video again so the patient's got both the upper and the lower plate in place and she's going to move and i'm going to encourage um Anne to move forward she's shaking here you see that little tremor but it's fine Claire's got the retractors in. I can see what's going on. She's going forwards and backwards, side to side. And I get her to go all over. And I try to say to the patient, Look, imagine you're drawing a circle on that plate. Try and draw a circle on it. It's really, it's super clever. I get really excited when I'm doing this. I love it because I take that out and the patient draws the most amazing point and that point there is centric relation it's so accurate it's lovely and then what i do is i get a little disc over this and it's got a hole in it it's a little countersink hole this is a gerber condylator system and it's got a little hole in it i put a hole right over where the apex of that triangle is so i just heat up some wax stick it on and that's my centric relation position. So now I've got to take that back to the mouth and then make sure the lower pin goes into the countersink hole there of the patient. And so make sure it goes in, the patient holds that position, and then I get Futar D bite registration material and inject that in between the upper and lower plates together. And I do this with the photographic retractors in. So Cl Claire's holding those retractors there so I can see directly into the mouth. The patient's just sitting up and I'm just squirting that in there like that. Dead accurate. And it comes out like this. And when we turn it around and have a look at it from the inside, I can just make sure that pin's, you know, locking nicely up there. And finally, at the reg appointment, I do a face bow and I just use a standard face bow bite fork on my carved rim. So I've carved that rim and I use uh, Futar D on that. We take that to the mouth. Patient just holds that in place. And then the face bow plus the CR record help Rowan or Sam to mount these models really really accurately and i find that this is so accurate in terms of getting a good centric relation position and then it's off to visit four now so and rowan sets the teeth up according to our photographs that we've given him so this is the arrangement that rowan has done and in fact rowan's lengthened the teeth here at the front there because they're not quite long enough he's put cold cure um dentine stain onto those teeth just to lengthen them just to give them and also we're given a recession which i love as well so there she is with the trying in place and it's great i really enjoy this appointment because it, it's claire's appointment it's not mine i i just set things up and then go out of the room and so we have 
we've got Anne sitting in the chair here. She's got some cold water. She's got the wax tray in there in place. And then she has a conversation with Claire. And it's lovely. And this is the, this is the actual video of that trying. And it, it's just great because the patient can look at this afterwards and truly see themselves as they're going to look socially. But what's really important is for Claire to get the patient to laugh so they can actually see themselves laughing as well. It's really lovely. And then they can analyze that. The patient can come in and they can bring in the partner, if they could, like John here, who's so supportive of um, Van. They're just such a lovely couple. And I, I'm out of the room. It's just the, the conversation is looking at the video, looking at the still photos, having a chat with Claire. I'm in the lab. And then they don't, they're not worried about offending me if there's stuff they don't like about it. We can make changes. It's great. And she loved it straight away. So she's got a really big overjet on this. We've got a 12.5 millimeter overjet. There's no bike platform. Um, I don't put a bike platform platform on that but the the bite is really positive here in that area there which is in the center of the denture you know if you measure from there to there there to there that's the chewing position it's really stable this denture so and that's the finished product and that's you know just a credit to rowan um, i'm so fortunate in working with such a fantastic um technician who's so talented um you know, with the longer teeth, recession, also incorporating cracks, just little cracks like that really make a difference. So just getting a scalpel blade, cutting into the tooth down and then sandblast it and rub in some composite stain and set it. And if, if it's terminated in a little crack at the end of the tooth, it looks fantastic, particularly if it's off center, you know, not in the middle of the tooth. It's brilliant. So and this is all beautifully border molded, lovely and thin underneath the base of the nose. Thin under here, super thin flange under the base of the nose. This is something else that John Besford really stressed and it does make dentures look amazing. You know, because the resorption is down here, it's not under the base of the nose. The nasal bone does not resorb. It's much further down and goes back. So these are the finished dentures in place there with that beautiful recession that Rowan's incorporated and the cracks running down and it's just lovely and the lovely uh, tinted gingivy too. I also replaced a lower um, denture. I just popped a, a zirconia RBB on the, for the patient just down here as well, just to tidy things up. It just looked nicer. So, so that's um, Anne finished. So this was the finished product for her and you know it was really you know big it just changed her life it was lovely um and you know we, i think we achieved this but finer that's what she wanted you know before and then after with this class two division two division one over jet but this is the actual key i just before i finish that I think trimming the Ailotragus parallel to the occlusal plane, it results in fabulous aesthetics for the dentures, it makes them look really beautiful. This is what she said actually, she wrote a massive testimonial and it's a bit tricky trying to work out what I should have put in here, but she said they are truly a work of art and look so natural. They have given me a lot of confidence, whether talking, eating or smiling, sometimes all at the same time. And the other thing which is really interesting, and this is, I can't tell you how often this happens when patients are referred to me, desperate. They really do not think there's any hope for them. Previous dentists, including the dental hospital, had made me think that nothing could be done about my teeth. And that had become quite scary. You know, so it's, um, we can do tremendous things with dentures. And dentures, I believe, are probably the most aesthetic appliance that we can make for a patient. 
uh, including and that includes all the implant stuff that we can do and veneers on reflection what would i do differently now is i would put a metal base in that definitive upper denture because i hate it when dentures crack and also patients really lose a lot of confidence when the denture cracks too so i would I routinely now put in metal reinforcement into all of my combination syndrome cases and also cases where we've got a full upper opposing an implant supported lower denture too. So, so that's what I do differently. Um, and that's, that's basically it. And this is, a, it's obviously still a massive tribute to John Bestford, who is still a wonderful mentor to me. Um, and thank you very much for your time this evening and everything is in the resources section if you want the pdf and the re references here on the website thank you i will now have a look at some of the questions so i'll go to chat there Thank you. That's great. How are you bonding the, hi Patrick, the zirconia bridge, please. Um, Patrick, I have, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, just come out of that and stop sharing this screen. If you just, so you can see me properly. Hello, Finley. Hi. Yeah, sorry, I've saved you doing all of that. I just couldn't get off mute. <laughs> um, I, I've got all the questions for you. I've been logging them through to save all you right. having to, to trawl through them. Please, um, may I ask, could I, could I answer Patrick's question first? Yep, yep, do that, and then I'll, I'll pick up the rest for you. So, um, Patrick, it's in this book here by... Uh, this is Matthias Kern's textbook who spoke at Bard a couple of years ago. He's fan flipping tastic. And it's, it's, it's just the same protocol as doing a, a normal resin bonded bridge with um, nickel chrome. So it's just sandblast, sandblast your fitting surface, um, put it into the ultrasonic bath, put your bonding agent on, which is Panavia, and then glue it on stick it on and they work really beautifully i'm finding that they're a great restoration he's got some really good data on that so sorry um uh steve no no finley no no not at all sorry that we had to to leave you trying to fish around there i just couldn't get i couldn't get off mute quick enough i think they did it's it all right purpose, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, well i've got to thank you on behalf of uh, of everybody for an absolutely outstanding presentation that always, every time I see you, and I didn't know how you'd manage with, uh, with the webinar, just the, the enthusiasm, the just pure passion and love of what you do comes through every time you talk. Uh, and I think that's inspirational for everybody who's, who's looking at what you're doing. Uh, and a testament to that is just how many questions you've got. Uh, a lot of interaction, uh, so thank you everybody for that as well. Um, <clears throat> before that though, I'd just like to say, I think the last summary, the way you said, uh, the statement from her was talking, eating and smiling, often all at the same time. <laughs> that's, that's the nailer really, because I, I've grown up knowing people with dentures and we assumed them to always be poorly fitting. They were managing them with their lips. They were kind of either eating or they were smiling, but they were always conscious that they were trying to control them. What you've given someone back is real stability and they're just that natural confidence to just function normally again. Um, and I think that's just stunning. So I'm going to move you on to the practicalities. So it's going to be a bit of a grilling, I think. Um, okay. So we've got from uh, Mike Gregory. Um, is the four-month reline by Rowan heat cure or self-cure resin, please? It's self-cure resin. It's, uh, it's Shotlander Pegasus material. Absolutely awesome. Thank you very much. And that was for <laughs> Mike Gregory earlier on. quick. Steve... <clears throat> <laughs> Steve, it was Steve Taylor um, asked, do you find that light body silicon has an advantage uh, over fit checker? Um, to be honest, Steve, I've not tried fit checker. 
Um, and I think fit checker would work perfectly well. I just find that um, the, uh, the Shotlander stuff in the gun, <laughs> I, I can just squirt it in and it just does the job and it works really, really well. But I, I think it really, the material is not particularly important as long as it's really light bodied, uh, Steve. So uh, carry on using fit check if you like it. And then uh, we have a question here from uh, Peter Livesey. When fabricating the special tray, uh, is Rowan only blocking out the undercuts rather than using a wax spacer all over? So which one? Was that the, if, let's talk about both, shall we? So the first special tray was a two part one. Um, so, and that was for zinc oxide eugenol. So for zinc oxide eugenol, that is a close fitting special tray. And then Rowan just, any little undercuts, he'll block out just to stop it from, uh, you know, catching different areas. Um, if the special tray, you know, is the definitive one, that's made with two wax spacers, as in three millimeters of space for my alginate impression. And then I recreate that space with my green stick stops on the post dam and also on the, um, on the canine points. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we've got a question here from um, uh, Shristi, uh, and they're saying sometimes with uh, high arch pallets, the alginate imp material doesn't record the highest uh, area posteriorly. Um, can you please suggest any tips and tricks, such as specific trays, etc., for a good primary impression uh, of a high arched uh, pallet? Uh, yes, I can actually. And um, so, it, with a high, really high arch, I would actually add some green stick um, or red cake compound to it and make a little gnome's hat that's just going to go up into the pallet. Um, with the with the compound first and then over the top of that I put alginate in and then it'll just record that high vault beautifully so red cake compound is perfect that's a brilliant answer and I love the way that, that you've got a little gnome's hat <laughs> so <laughs> so <it's great. laughs> and the way you popped it up as well Okay, so um, we had a question from Shane Gordon. I was asking, why not use uh, a modified denture duplication technique for phase two denture, thus incorporating all of the great features you have worked so hard to achieve in the phase one denture? Yes, you could definitely do that. And that's a really good idea, particularly if you like the denture aesthetics. But I find, I, I always find that it's, I like to go back to square one because there are so many details and features that I like to incorporate into a new one that the old one just it doesn't have. So it's a little bit like making a silk purse out of a sow's ear type of approach because the immediate denture, it really doesn't fit that well later on. You know, the, all of the periphery, the whole thing is just not as good. So I like to go for the Rolls Royce at the end of it, which is really just going for it. And also, I tend to find from an aesthetic perspective, there's so many details that I do want to change um, because we, we don't have the opportunity of doing a proper wax, carving the wax rim um, at all uh, for the first step. It's just like it's a massive jump from impressions to denture. Whereas we've just got time and we can actually really go to town with getting the aesthetics done perfectly. So I don't use copy text at all unless it is a definitive denture and it's a definitive denture that we want to copy again, you know, further on down the line. Or, or if the patient is wanting two sets of dentures, sometimes we make a pair and they wear one on a Tuesday, one on a Wednesday, one, you know, swap them. So they wear at different rates. So that's when I tend to do um, copy tech uh, techniques. Fantastic. Okay, so we had a question earlier on. Uh, we know that you showed uh, the way you were capturing the Gothic Arch tracing and setting that uh, vertical dimension. But um, uh, 
well, what Peter Livesey was just asking for a bit more detail. So when you're using the Gothic Arch Tracer, how do you accurately determine the height of the pin? And no, that is definitely the height that you, you want to have it at okay. before they start doing all the movements. That's right. So what we do is actually, and I've not, I haven't gone into detail with that this evening, uh, Peter. Um, but um, what we do is at the, what I do is at, at the visit two, which is the definitive impression stage, um, I do a primary rim at that stage. And I trim that primary rim to where I feel the vertical is. And then that means that we can then mount and we use that primary rim to mount the working cast. So the working cast is then we've got it mounted on the articulator. And, and then, so I, I've got that there for visit three when I'm doing my proper definitive wax rim carving and also do my gothic arch tracing so i carve up the wax rim first and then get the right vertical in the mouth i then take off the rim and take it to my articulated models which have been articulated using my primary reg there i then close down the articulator to to that vertical dimension there onto the rim so the teeth touch the rim on the articulator I close the pin to touch at the same height I then take off the upper rim and then put on my gothic arch tracing both on the top and the bottom and adjust a little screw there's a little screw on that lower pin I can just jack it up or down and I can then make that to the exact height that my carved rim is and then I can then go to the mouth and do that and then and and uh, and then I can then comfortably do my gothic arch tracing at the vertical that I've already carved my rim at and um, and it's really it works really beautifully because you're absolutely right Peter looking at the patient um, with the with the gothic arch tracing system in place um, their lips have caved in because there's no lip support with it. So it's very difficult to judge the right vertical for the patient. So that's how I get around it. It's a slightly long winded, but I do have a reference for that in my, if you look at my uh, complete denture manual, it's actually in there and it talks about that system, how I do it. Yeah, well that, I mean, this isn't so much a, a question as a comment, but Diane Alexandra said that uh, it's an awesome presentation. She'd love to attend a hands-on course. And just that little bit of detail you've thrown straight into there just shows how there's so much to go into. So I think you can have a lot of people desperate when they can to get onto a hands-on course with you here. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I've got a couple more questions. I'm going to have to let you go because we can't grill you all night. Um, but we, uh, we have some good ones uh, here for you. Um, so we've got a, um, a question here from uh, Binod, which is asking, can you use the Zaflora Khan window technique for the final impression in the definitive denture? Da -da. Can you use it? I've never heard of the Zaflora Khan window technique for the final yeah. impression. It, is, it yeah, maybe, I'm just asking. Is it a flabby ridge? Um, I genuinely don't know. Uh, this is um, from Bill. Maybe we'll have to get come back to them after that one uh, and uh, get an answer for them. So we have one from Simon Belford. So how do you balance the occlusion in lateral excursions when treating a full arch denture against a full arch natural dentition? That, and by the way, fabulous presentation. Thank you, Simon. That's really kind. Um, it's flipping hard, Simon, because... Uh, but I, first of all, what we do is Rowan sets the teeth up in balanced articulation on the articulator so that it's, it's all beautifully balanced. And we've done it with a face bow. We've done it with the Gothic arch. So what I'm absolutely must have is lovely, even contact in centric relation. You know, when the patient bites together, it is, they just cannot tell which side they're touching. And that's what I go for. I don't bother about anything else. And if, if the patient does go into excursions, the, I always find my dentures tip, you know, and rock 
on that because having the articulator just the same as the patient is very difficult. Now, if I have a patient with a really flat maxilla, then this is when I've got to think a little bit outside the box, you know, like as in really poor retention. So this is when I often use, um, uh, we, we try and balance it as much as possible on the articulator, yes. But when we go to the mouth, we try and use the patient as their own articulator by, I mix up carborundum paste, which is like a really gritty paste with toothpaste. I put that onto the teeth and then get the patient to just gently just mill the denture teeth in so that we're getting a little bit of three millimeters of an envelope of, of movement there. So that's, that's one system that I do use um, to get true balanced articulation. Um, then other times what we have done is just to put like inlays in the upper teeth, like gold inlays. So do them in wax first, functional generated path, in the mouth and then get those cast up and then fit it into the denture as well. And that's really super cool and super neat. Um, but it is, it's quite expensive. And I find that I know it's a little bit out there, but truly if I just set, talk to the patient when I fit the dentures and say to them, look, I want you to become a chopper, not a grinder that, you know, you've got some really beautifully fitting, um, lumps of well-engineered plastic in your mouth that are prostheses and they're not going to operate like natural teeth. So think of a crocodile, not a sheep. So become a chopper, not a grinder as well, you know, for eating. So it's just learning to adapt and use them properly. Okay. And I've got one final question. And I think it probably, it's probably one that, that is going to come up more and more because we are at this point now where everybody's starting to think of digital in one phase or another. So uh, Julian Kaplan's asking, uh, love the techniques. Are you thinking of digital for any of the um, uh, pra uh, procedures? So, um, yeah, I, I'm certainly, Julian, thank you very, very much for, um, again for the question. So I um, am really, really, really interested in, in um, digital. Uh, I do want to uh, go down that path. I can't see it at the moment helping me because of the way, particularly maybe scanning impressions is going to come in, but even printing, the, the, the end products are just not as good as um, handmade products um, in terms of the aesthetics, there's certain detail. And at the end of the day, everything is analog that we put in people's mouths. So, it's at the moment I'm a little bit like sort of an audio file that likes vinyl records and stuff and, you know, not digital, but I'm certainly not shutting the door at all on it. It will happen. We will be able to scan the mouth. I can't wait to be able to scan the mouth and then do that in four dimensions where we're doing it in time, you know, for all the depth of the sulcus moving. We're also doing it in terms of depth of the soft tissues, scanning the soft tissues for the depth. So we've got compression. So we're properly working out exactly what's going on and then we can engineer something to fit in the mouth. You know, but I think printed chromes will come in very soon. They're still not good enough. I still prefer beautifully cast ones at the moment. Um, but, we, you know, we will get there, definitely. So, uh, it's watch this space, Julian, I think. <laughs> well, uh, Finley, I'm going to have to, uh, genuinely, the questions keep coming in, uh, and that just shows just how engaging your talk is, as it always is. Uh, but I have to thank you for an awesome evening. I have to thank everybody for attending, uh, and just remind everybody that we have a series of these study clubs going on, uh, and will continue to go on, uh, and we will have continually great, I mean, world-class speakers. I've, I've got to mention, uh, I, I know that you're not the kind of guy that likes this stuff, Finley, but you are, you know, you travel all over the world, you speak everywhere, and the fact that we have you in our presence, I think, is just awesome. And the fact that you're always so open, so engaged, and so enthusiastic, it just really makes you look at dentures 
and and you think that's something the way it transformed that patient's life is something you want to be able to engage with and do do better at and i think it's so funny that nadim said at the beginning you you hated them so if you can go from hating to loving them in the way you love them there's hope for us all i think in dentistry that's so uh I've just got to thank you again. Uh, an awesome presentation. So much feedback. And please, everybody, make a note. Join us again. And it looks like you're going to get a lot of people wanting to book for a hands-on course, Finley. So awesome. uh, keep that diary open. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. That's Enjoy cool. the rest of your evening, everybody. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody on behalf of myself, the rest of the executive committee, and, of course, uh, Nadim, our current uh, president. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.